I became a journalist on, on the old right. did a bit of everything really, football. <coughs> I was a very bad football writer. I thought I was going to be a genius and um, I was going to be the Neville Carlos of the, the day. Uh, so the first match I was sent was Blackpool, then as now bottom of the first division, uh, and, um, against Chelsea, uh, then not as now top of um, the Premier League, whatever it's called. And uh, Blackpool scored three goals in the first half, uh, but Chelsea managed three goals in the second half, and an own goal was scored by a Blackpool player to give Chelsea victory. So I spent I had 24 hours to write this, and I agonised over it, and I, like the protagonists of a Greek tragedy, Blackpool took on the gods of Chelsea. And just as Oedipus Rex put out his own eyes, I'm so proud of it. So it was Blackpool's hapless fullback Hutchinson who netted the ball to give the top premise of a victory. To my astonishment, this appeared as written in the Guardian the following day. Nobody mentioned a word about it. And that my colleagues, I, I realise now, were being very polite and courteous until the night news editor went on to become foreign editor on the grounds that he'd never been abroad except on D-Day. <laughs> night editor uh, said, I right, enjoyed your piece, Simon. Oh, thank you very much, Joe. He said, will you tell me one thing? Were they playing with the ball or being discus? <laughs> I'll let you learn from um, the students which <coughs> Ron Chopper Harris, who the old football fans when we remember used to play with Chelsea. The entire Chelsea team would spend until five in the morning gambling in Blackpool that day. And they, they were desperately hung over in the first half. And then obviously they had some Bernay Brancor or something, which is why they were. Um, he, Chopper House also told the story about manager Tommy Doherty, who said, um, Right, Ronnie's that we're playing a new Manchester United. Nobody called them Man U in those days. They're playing Manchester United, they've got a new lad there on their team, he's called George Best. Apparently he's good. I want you to take him out. And Harris said, but boss, supposing I go for him too hard, they might send me off. Aye, he said, they might. But put it this way, lad, they'll miss him more than we'll miss you. <laughs> I went to Northern Ireland, which was part of the actually my favourite story about Northern Ireland, just before I arrived, and there was a terrible thunderstorm in uh, Belfast, and the colleague of mine from the Mirror went to investigate, and it had hit a church, and it said masonry and concrete, and <clears throat> wood timbers flying into the choir stalls where choir practice had ended two minutes before. And he found the minister walking around in the days and the minister said, truly, the Lord has been merciful to us tonight. <clears throat> Chris said, um, well, I assume <clears throat> you're insured. Ah, oh, well, then you see, unfortunately, we're not covered against acts of God. <laughs> Which might be the story of the Northern Ireland crisis, actually. But, um, the end pace, I can Oh, anyway. Let me smell your breath. That's what he said. Also, you didn't need a pass to get into this press conference, you just need to have your breath smell. Uh, Willie Whitelaw was the first um, uh, Secretary of State when we had the Red Rule in 1971. Um, Willie was famous for his Williisms, of which, he, in a perverse way, he was quite proud. He was being asked at his first press conference about some paramilitary marches which had been going on in Belfast and he was clearly unbriefed and didn't want to commit himself to anything but the Irish papers kept pressing him, what did he think, what was he going to do? Finally he said, I've always said it was a great mistake ever to prejudge the past. <laughs> to which there is no answer at all. Um, then you remember the second 1974 election when Labour had just in power by a fingernail and um, he had a press conference in which he said um, that Dennis Healy, then Chancellor, was going around the country telling people that things were much better economically than they actually were. They're going around the country, he said, stirring up complacency. <laughs> <laughs> he could go to autopilot, but it was a very scheduled as a some conservative function, and um, everybody he met shook hands with him and meet the great Deputy Prime Minister, and he'd say, marvellous, marvellous. I missed us you. Marvellous, marvellous. I've always been a great admirer of yours, Mr. Whitelaw. Marvellous, marvellous, marvellous. I very much forget to tell you, Mr. Whitelaw, that my husband died this morning. Marvellous, marvellous. <laughs> actually, one of us could have was much, much smarter than he looked when he could get He, one time he was, he was on the left of the Tory party, the Liberal wing, if you like, and it was, uh, 
speaking in favor of a very right-wing conservative, as a by-election, traditionally the visiting politician gives yeah. another press conference, and he was asked about a report on the probation service, which the candidate had said was disgraceful, uh, soft, woolly, liberal, blah, 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 should be screwed up and thrown into the waste paper basket. What did Willie think? He agreed completely. Yes, I agree entirely. Should be screwed up, thrown in the waste paper basket, then taken out again, smoothed down, and considered very, very careful. Which leads up to his person who, as Thatcher famously said, every, every Prime Minister needs her Willie. Yeah, hey, famous um, She was um, a great one for people on Tumblr, but also. Remember, she, when she was leaving the opposition, she was invited to the children's Christmas party at Westminster. It's held for the children of political correspondents and for a, a special school in Westminster. And she was a star guest, and she went around, and the little boy was sobbing into his bowl of dessert. And she said, what's the matter, little boy? I'm so sure I got this from Father Christmas, no less, played by the chairman of the lobby at the time. What's the matter, little boy, she said. The boy, Miss, miss, they've given me blancmange and I don't like blancmange. Yes, yeah, she said. That's what parties are all about. Eating <laughs> food you don't like. <laughs> <laughs> so the definition of a government would be hard to better. You would like to consider it. Okay, um, Ted Heath was extraordinary. I am um, covered in with John Sargent a couple of times and um, we got awfully bored because everywhere we went he Heath would give exactly the same speech and everywhere we went, people would say, good luck Ted, or good on you Mr. Heath, best of luck, etc. So we got into the habit, Sergeant and I, of um, standing behind vans or cars or advertising hoardings and shouting meaningful slogans such as, resist import surcharges on the Italian model Mr. Heath. <laughs> Say no to a redefinition of the M3 money supply. Ted. <laughs> so many times. What? Absolute bewilderment. I'll we'll, um, we'll finish with uh, um, coming back from Glasgow on the plane with Ted once. We were, um, uh, Sandra and I were sitting together and uh, we, it was Dan Air. Do you remember Dan Air? Make the prior air look like the Orient Express. <laughs> Absolutely terrible airline, and then they, they stewed us, she stewed us, hated us, loathed us, uh, and quite rightly because we drank too much and we were just awful. But um, anyway, I'm sitting there and um, with John, and the, the, we're taxiing to the active runway at Glasgow, and um, uh, John reaches up and presses the orange button, and suddenly the chief stewardess, who we had nicknamed Rosa Clebb, who was learning to <laughs> one of them, came unstrapped from her seat, came storming down the aisle, said, Do you realise? That likes the emergency alarm in the cockpit. What might I ask is the emergency? And John said, with that great calm you'll have noticed from his points, he said, uh, you'll notice my friend here pointed to me, needs a drink. He said, that is not an emergency! Said, uh, yes, I'm afraid, I have to correct you, my friend is an alcoholic. <laughs> when I say he needs a drink, I mean he needs a drink. <laughs> You'd see the steam coming out of our ears. And in particular, said John, he needs a gin and tonic. And at that point, she just gave us the most baleful expression I've ever seen on anyone's face, ever. I stormed off back to her seat, and John said, And while you're up, would you get me one? <laughs> the final line is to so I mentioned Thatcher's um, Double Entendres, and there are a host of these. And I've never seen a tool as big as that. And, uh, workshop. Um, my my all-time favourite, I always say that because others must speak, but uh, it was on the Falcon. She was doing a victory tour. They took just one journalist with them, and that was Chris Von Keefe, the wonderful uh, press association correspondent. And, uh, he was there, and she went to inspect an enormous gun, kind of like a blind ride-on lawnmower, only with a 15-foot barrel pointing up from a bluff onto a plane over which the Argies would have to march if they reinvaded. And she admired this piece of kit immensely and said, um, uh, we were asked about it in the squad, he said, would you like to fire a round, ma'am? And she looked at him and said, eh, but won't it jerk me off? And <laughs> <laughs> Christopher said, the, the look of the, 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 the squaddy's face. <laughs> Um, so much astonishment was to, 
in the church. <laughs>